Tonight, we continue exploring our brain with a conversation about pain. Pain serves a very important function for us to survive. It teaches us what to avoid and lets us know when to seek medical help. At the same time, though, it can create tremendous suffering. St. Augustine once said, the greatest evil is physical pain. The 100 million Americans who live with it every day would no doubt agree. Pain knows no boundaries and affects men and women regardless of age or race. Beyond its physical symptoms, the experience of chronic pain often leads to feelings of isolation and hopelessness. Dr. Eric Kandel, he is a Nobel laureate of Professor at Columbia University and a Howard Hughes medical investigator. Our subject is pain. This is really one of the great unmet medical needs and enormous uh, problem in society. Uh, in the most general terms, pain is an unpleasant sensation in response to a real or potential threat of body injury. Uh, and it has an extremely important defensive, adaptive role. It's designed to remove the injured part of the body from the source of damage. Uh, and usually this is transient in nature, but with some diseases such as cancer or arthritis, it becomes persistent and becomes actually not an adaptive process, but part of the disease process itself and contributes to the misery one feels with cancer with arthritis. And in some cases, as we'll hear from Laurie Klein, chronic pain is a disease in its own right. Um, as these arguments make clear, this is an enormous public health problem. A hundred million Americans, as you pointed out, suffer from pain every year, and it's the most common reason people seek medical attention. There are two kinds of chronic pain, inflammatory or nociceptive pain and neuropathic pain. Inflammatory or nociceptive pain uh, is damage to soft tissue, and it shows the adaptive role of pain perfectly. It's designed to remove the injured part of the body away from the damaging stimulus uh, so as to prevent further damage from occurring and to allow reparative processes to take place. But sometimes sort of a uh, uh, hypersensitivity develops uh, with as a result of the inflammatory process so that relatively noxious stimulus like just touching the hand feel painful to the person. Uh, Inflammatory pain is due to uh, damage of soft tissue, but neuropathic pain involves, in addition to soft tissue damage, actually damage to the nerve fibers themselves. And this in, not only in, often involves hypersensitivity, but involves spontaneous pain and burning pain. Moreover, it shows an interesting phenomenon that we'll see with Lori Klein, and that is a phenomenon of sensitization, whereby the pain spreads from its initial site uh, of, uh, of injury <clears throat> to other parts of the body. For example, if I damage my fingertip um, with sensitization, it can spread up the finger, up to the hand, the forearm, all the way reaching to the shoulder. So this is really a, a very serious pro uh, process uh, that could cause a great deal of pain for the person. Um, these processes need not be independent, so inflammatory and neuropathic pain can occur together. As in Lori's case, uh, the inflammatory nociceptive pain can, re uh, can lead to neuropathic pain. Um, one of the remarkable things about pain is that we've made enormous progress in understanding it uh, in the last two decades. Our understanding of pain until recently uh, was amazingly limited. It is the most mysterious of all sense modalities. And it's only recently we've begun to make really significant progress. And the people around the table have been major contributors to this. One of the first people to think about this was Aristotle in the fourth century before Christ. And he thought pain was due to the fact that an evil spirit entered the body at the site of injury. A punishment from God. Punishment from God. And this idea persisted <clears throat> through the Middle Ages into the Renaissance. This, these were bad people, and that's why they were suffering pain. This changed in the 17th century with this great philosopher, mathematician, René Descartes, uh, who uh, developed a completely different view of pain. He thought of pain as a biological process, and he drew this uh, wonderful drawing uh, of a young uh, boy uh, being burnt, his 
toes being injured and fibers were carrying the information about injury directly from the toe into the brain. Although the details of this model are not what we now view as the pain process, the general idea that it's a biological process is the current view. But the question is, what is the nature of the biological process? It's remarkable to realize that until 20 years ago, we did not have a good understanding until the nature of the nature of the biological process involved. People thought that pain was very different from all of the sense modalities. For each sense modality, you have specific receptors like you have rods and cones in the retina, you have uh, olfactory receptors uh, in the nose. Each sensory modality has a private line, receptors that are specific to it, and nerve fibers that lead into the See, nervous hear, system. See, hear, smell, touch. Exactly. Uh, with pain, people thought that it may not have a system of its own, that it hijacks other systems, and it doesn't have receptors of its own. So, for example, many people thought that pain was the touch system, the tactile system, stimulated inappropriately. We now know that this is wrong. There are specific fibers that mediate the pain sensation. Many of these are small caliber fibers, many of these are unmyelinated fibers, and they're specific to mechanical pain, to thermal pain, and to chemically induced pain. And this is the breakthrough. This is a major breakthrough, but a further breakthrough occurred when we began to identify specific receptors that mediate this. And David Julius, who's here, was one of the people who yeah. characterized one of these receptors. Uh, these are ion channels called trip channels. They respond to both thermal and chemical stimuli, and this was a wonderful advance. And a major scientist in England, Jeffrey Wood, discovered tactile pain receptors. Uh, he discovered a group of uh, kids, it actually began with a Pakistani family, then extended it to others, that are congenitally insensitive to pain. This was written up in last Sunday's New York Times. Yeah. These kids are fearless. They can put their hand into boiling water without even being aware that they're doing it. They don't feel pain, so the whole defensive function of pain is lost for them. They do unbelievably silly things and dangerous things because they don't have a fear of pain because ne they've never perceived it. Uh, so this turned out to be due to a sodium channel and that also is interesting because we have sodium channels all over the body. That's how we generate action potentials. But this is a special kind of sodium channel that carries this particular kind of uh, uh, mutation that gives rise to insensitivity to pain. Another mutation in that channel gives to hypersensitivity to pain. So for the first time we're really getting a profound understanding uh, into the nature of pain, both in a biological sense but also in a psychological sense. We'll see as we discuss Laurie's injury, which occurred in a gymnastic competition, that you, unlike many other things in medicine, you cannot measure pain objectively. It's a completely personal experience. So your response to pain will vary depending upon the context in which you experience it, whether you're attending it or not. Yeah. Your sex, physicians have to learn how to listen to patients very carefully in order to really appreciate how this particular person is responding to pain. And we're gonna see as we go around the table with these four people, each of whom have pioneered a different aspect of pain, how not only clinical sensitivity, but also important advances in biology have brought us to a new level. I just want to make one point, and one of the reasons we selected this program to come uh, after amyotrophic lateral sclerosis right, right. is because it shows the extremes. In amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, you have a single cell type that is damaged and ultimately dies. Here, we involve the whole brain. So this is really an extremely, probably as complex a disorder as you can come across in brain science. And we have to remind each other that even though you and I enjoy brain science enormously, we're at the beginning of a great mountain range. I agree. There's much of brain science we don't understand. And I think pain brings out how much more we need to learn. Yeah. So I think the fact that the methodologies are moving along Imaging is now being used in a more routine way to study pain. Molecular biology of receptors is only, you know, a decade and a half old. And we're realizing that there are connections between this and depression, and we see the same neural circuits are being recruited. This will help us get better understanding and better treatment.
Um, 